I feel honored to be here. Um, this is my first time at uh, the nation. And my inclusion on the panel implies some sort of parity with these people. There is no parity. I, my contribution to the gay cause has been nil compared to these people who have done so much to uh, advance on the cause of our equality in all these years. So uh, it's a great compliment to me to uh, be here. Um, I want to say that I speak in my personal capacity uh, today. Um, uh, in a sense, everybody says that you know, when you speak uh, on a panel. But politics is slightly different. Um, your personal values become your political motivations. So in a sense, that dichotomy is slightly, that distinction is slightly uh, inaccurate when we talk about uh, uh, politics. Um, but in any case, I hope I can, you will accept what I say uh, as me rather than you know, as, as some sort of image that I might uh, uh, portray. Um, now, there are two ways of engaging with the question of homophobia. The first is whether it's true, the moral question. So that means that homosexuality is illegal and therefore should be controlled. The second is the utilitarian argument. It's useful to society in some way. Uh, therefore, homophobia should be perpetuated, uh, keep people in the shadows of the darkness. Uh, and you will find that when you dispense with both of these ideas, we are left purely with the, the prejudice that underlies homophobia and nothing else. Uh, it's a fascinating thing. Once you demolish one after another after another argument, you're simply left with the fact that people cannot deal with the idea of homosexuality. Um, so, having said that as a sort of uh, uh, basis for the rest of the remarks, I'm going to say a lot of people told me, quite a lot of people actually, don't ramble, but don't ramble, but 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So I'm going to keep it to 10 minutes as uh, best I can. <laughs> Um, initially, the question, the, the topic was uh, LGB, LGB and the future of LGB and politics. But I think that's rather narrower than the one we settled on, which is LGB voices for the future, which is a better way of structuring it, I think. Because politics um, is about a nation, and it's about how that nation deals with the rest of the world. And therefore, it has to encompass a whole range of values motivations, outlooks of life. Um, and so it has to deal with uh, a whole range of people. I'll give you one example. When we were campaigning during the GE 2011 and I was at a coffee shop in 6th Avenue and there was a family there, a nice little class of family having breakfast. And the son stood up as I went to shake their hands and he said, Dr. Vincent, do you have a gay agenda? <laughs> I said, well, you know, you look at the SDP's program in its entirety, and I thought these guys were like Christians, so I'll go on the poverty angle, you know. And so I said, we have an agenda for poverty as well. And she actually said to me, I don't care about poverty, I only care about your gay agenda. So I thought, okay, like, whether you are Christian, you might be. Um, I don't know how widespread that view is, but Nevertheless, politicians, the reality is that politicians have to deal with that, engage with that. Um, which is why, for me, the issue makes more sense when we talk about it in relation to voices, you know. Uh, politicians have a hard time straddling the, 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 the kind of framework that we work in. Um, so, the point is that we shouldn't look to partisan politics, formal politics to find a home for the LGBT issue. Uh, it goes beyond that. It exists within it, but it goes beyond that as well. And at this point, I'll make a plug. The SDP, long before I joined, is the first and only party to take a positive stand on the abolition of Section 3778. And that was the uh, uh, motivation that Dr. Chisun John, who is with us today, brought to this particular question. And I think it's something that we continue uh, to be proud of. But moving beyond that, the issue for me is a very simple one. It's prejudice. And prejudice flourishes in the shadows, like a virus. The minute you turn the light on that prejudice, it dissipates, it, it, it disappears. Uh, you think about how in the past women were prevented from voting, Jews were prevented from entering various parliaments all over the world, Catholics couldn't go to Oxford and Cambridge universities. 
um, black people to be married, white people. And then one day, a little black woman decided she was going to sit at the front of the bus. And after that moment, gradually the voices that objected to black people sitting in the front of the, voice, uh, of the bus got smaller and smaller and smaller. Today, we have a black person sitting in the white house in that country. Um, so to me, in a sense, change doesn't come from revolution. Most of the revolutions in history had in fact failed. If you look at it, Russia, China, France is a slightly different uh, situation. <laughs> um, change comes from the ordinary bravery of ordinary people taking the words that Martin Luther took when he said, here I stand, I can do no other. Now, the, uh, that idea was extended by Aung San Suu Kyi. She took a, a, what do you call it, a traffic junction analogy. She said, change is like someone standing at a traffic junction. When one person stands there, and it's a busy road, you cannot cross. But when a multitude of people collect at that junction and they surge into the street, no power in the world can stop the change that will allow them to cross the road. And I think that's the concept that I like us, I would like us to focus on, uh, which is the idea of individuals, ordinary people like us, speaking up, coming out, um, using the various means, for example, like the initiative that Sayoni has introduced today. And when we do that, when the change occurs in our workplaces and in our homes and in our schools, then it will arrive on the floor of parliament. And then it will no longer be simply a negative abolition uh, 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 initiative, but it will be positive initiatives to uh, uh, bring uh, our rights to levels of equality consistent with the heterosexual majority. But in order to do that, and I close with this, in order to do that, every one of us has a responsibility. Uh, that responsibility can be small or large for different people, but it's a responsibility we all have to share to build the bridge where we are now to that point in the future, which is where we want to be. And in a sense, it's not a building of a bridge. It's a reverse concept. It's a tearing down of centuries and centuries of indoctrination and, and prejudice. And how do we do it? It's a, it's a form of a counter uh, 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 conversation, a counter discourse, when we attack in logical terms all the different prejudicial underpinnings of the homophobia uh, perspective. And then suddenly we all arrive at a place where we realize these prejudices were fairly silly. I mean, how many of us would think that women shouldn't have the vote now? Fairly silly idea now. A hundred years ago, the, the opposite idea, women should have the vote, was the silly idea. So, the resources that we need for this, a basic understanding of the rules of logic, so we can challenge and fight with our, not well, physically of course, but fight with our people. Uh, in whatever forums exist, Facebook is a very important forum for that. Um, and also the information that we need, the historical information, which allows us to say, for example, you work an eight hour day now, that had to be fought for. People were working 12 to 15 hour days at one point. And the other thing that we need, finally, is that basic acceptance of who we are. I don't even say pride. To me, that idea that I'm proud to be gay is no more sensible than I'm proud to be Singaporean or whatever. It's just me. So it's a basic acceptance rather than a basic pride. And when those moments of despondence arrive, when those moments of uh, uh, grief or, or, um, or uh, pessimism arrive, then you look back and you think that Alexander the Great and Frida Kahlo and Jane Addams, the Nobel Prize winner, and Tchaikovsky and the list can go on. All these people were in the family that we call our own. Thank you very much. <laughs>